and Prof. Professor Guaitain, the chairman of the School of Oriental Studies in the, at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, on page 21 of his book, Jews and Arabs, he repeats the same words. He says, there is much more to the popular belief that Jews and Arabs are close relatives, cousins. He puts down cousins, close relatives, and he says cousins, because they were descended from the brothers Isaac and Ishmael, the sons of Abraham, coming from the same father, Abraham. They were cousins. And the latest, the latest, on the 1st of January this year, 1989, 1st of January, Danny Ben Tal, a Jew, described as a reservist in the Israeli army during his latest tour of duty in Gaza. This Jew, he is serving in the Israeli army during his latest tour of duty in Gaza, reports in the Star again. This is not a Muslim newspaper. They refuse to put our our Edward a second time because of the Jewish protest. We wanted to repeat our Edward. They stopped it and said, no, our Jewish people, customers, they don't want us to have the thing in. That star reports this young Jew talking. He is a journalist. He says that a Palestinian state already exists. This state of Palestine already exists. Let there be no mistake about that. I said, you have a product for which you have a market of 12 million. Simply by changing the label, you get 700 million people to buy. I said, you are a fool if you didn't say. You know, let's become Muslims. What is the difference by God? What is the difference? What is the real difference? There is really no difference except we say, Jew, I say I'm a Muslim and we are at war. So at question time, one young Jew, he says, now who's going to do the job? Who will do the job? I say you. You will have to do the job. You're sitting on our chest. You Jews are sitting on our chest. Meaning in the 67 war, they flattened the Arab world in six days. So you're sitting on our chest. I said, get off, get off our chest and say, brother, look, we have done you wrong. Please forgive us. Where can we go? And by God, I says, these Arabs will say, cousin, live with us. We have been living for a thousand years without strife. We can still continue to live. But I says, give him your hand of friendship, your compassion and see what happens. The young Jew, he said, you know, I have just returned from the six day war. I'm going to complete my medical studies. And as soon as I return home, meaning to Israel, I will take your message home to Israel. And I see evidence of that happening. I see evidence of that happening. So, they have to get together. I, I speak as a Christian. I asked the question of Mr. Finlay. The question was raised earlier on. Why is there such a big lobby in the United States Congress against the Arab states. And my, I asked him, and I think he agrees with me, I did speak to him. It's based upon the false Christian doctrine of premillennialism, which tries to put Christ back in a physical, on the physical throne in Jerusalem. And so the people in the United States who lobby against the Arabs are scared that they're going to blaspheme God if they don't allow this to happen. But my, my, my question to him is, is it not true that the doctrine of premillennialism is false? And in fact, in Christianity, there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, bond nor free. We are all one together. Thank you for that question. One day in rural Illinois, when I was seeking re-election to Congress, a young man, a very serious young man who was then an official of the county government came to me and he said, with nothing in the way of malice in his manner, 
He said with greatest sincerity, I must warn you what you are saying and attempting to do in regard to the Middle East is going against God's will. And he warns you, he warns the Jews in their own holy book, the own holy Bible, the Old Testament, which is the Bible of the Jews, in the last and final will of Moses, the last will and testament of Moses, the book of Deuteronomy, fifth book, chapter 28, verse 68. Moses is speaking and the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt. You have already come out. Though I told you, look man, I have freed you from Egypt, but he'll bring you back. Slaves, you'll be sold as slaves. Your men and your women will be sold as slaves. I'm reading your book. I don't know whether there are any Jews who are listening or whether they'll carry my words to them. God says, he says, I, you will be sold a second time, a second bondage, only once you have been in bondage so far in Egypt. This is the second bondage God is promising the Jews. You'll be sold as born men and born women, slave men and slave women. And no man shall buy you. You'll be such a rubbish that nobody will have you even. Even as slaves, they won't own you. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 68. Look, I said, you are set up for all this. This is a setup going on. You are not going to listen. It's right. He gives you rope. He gives you rope. He's given you rope. Go on, go on, as he gave Hitler rope. This mighty Hitler. I said, great. In, 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 in terror, in cruelty. His army is marching to Russia 2,000 kilometers non-stop. You know, that man, Hitler, because of him, 40 million people died. The Second World War. But there is hope. There is hope. According to Holy Scriptures, there is hope. There is a chance. You see, every time God Almighty gives people power, position, might, is a test. How you use it. And to give you an example from the Holy Quran and the Holy Bible, we read the story about the Palestinians and the Jews. This is not a new story. It is more than 3,000 years old. The Bible speaks about the confrontation between the Palestinians and the Jews for 3,000 years. You read there from the very beginning, from the book of Deuteronomy, it carries on. That again and again, the Jews they destroyed the Palestinians utterly. Men, women, children, and even donkeys were not spared. Again, destroyed them utterly. And they come back from where? Nobody knows. And they destroyed them again utterly. And again they come back, no one knows where. This battle between the Palestinians and the Jews have been going on for 3,000 years. This is nothing new. At one stage, in the confrontation between the Jews and the Palestinians. The Palestinians, they have Goliath in their midst, a giant, an eight-foot giant. Naturally, puny people, when they have a big man in their midst, they now feel that they can now confront the Jews because they have a giant in their midst. So the Palestinians on one hilltop, with Goliath in their midst, is shouting to the Jews on the opposite hill, so, oh Jews! It's my hope that my book and the work of others in the peace field will somehow awaken the American people, create understanding in time to avert the dreadful calamity that this gentleman's second question uh, forecasts. Thank you. On the question of is the book free or should we pay for it, please let it be known that if the price of the book has to be what it really is, then five rands would be by far insufficient. The book has been heavily subsidized by the Islamic Propagation Center of Durban and Mr. Paul Findlay doesn't make anything on it. Thank you. Next question, please. I do believe that the Jews and the Arabs have come from one seed, and that seed is Abraham. 
and they ought to be brothers. But the question is that they are not brothers today because they're still fighting against each other. Now, Mr. Dida uses the Holy Bible for a lot of his questions, for a lot of his answers. I would like to ask Mr. Dida to quote from the Bible, from Genesis chapter 16 and verse number 11 and 12, to answer that question. Why are the, the Jews and the, and the Arabs split? They are still today. fighting and you want him to quote from and Genesis? If Mr. Dida can please use the Bible again as he normally does to give an answer for the reason why they are still fighting today. Genesis chapter 16 verses number 11 and 12. Could you read the, the statement in the Bible? This is a, the angel of the Lord which spoke to Haga in the desert. He said, you are now with child and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. So. That's why they are still fighting today between the brothers, which are supposed to be brothers. Why does Israel not permit the Palestinians to be represented by the leadership of the Palestine Liberation Organization? There is no question but what the PLO, headed by Yasser Arafat, is the acknowledged leader of the Palestinians wherever they live, whether they be in the occupied territory or in South Africa. But Israel is in a very unique political position thanks to the United States. Israel does not have to deal with its neighbors in a normal fashion. In every other political situation of this sort, one party has been able to select its own leadership and the other party has been able to select its own leadership. But thanks to the power of Israel's lobby in the United States and the support that our government gives to the leadership of Israel, Israel is able to take this unprecedented position of demanding the right to select the leadership of the Palestinian movement itself. That's the root of the problem. Now, were it not for the extraordinary power of Israel's lobby in the United States, the government of Israel would be forced to come to terms in a normal fashion with its neighbors, including the Palestinians in the occupied territory. But as long as Israel can depend upon the uncritical, undivided, powerful financial, military, economic, and moral support of the United States, it does not have to behave in a normal fashion. That's the, the answer to your question, wherever the questioner is. And I believe there is something that that gentleman can do to make a change. Come, is there anybody there who's prepared to take me on? I'll chew you alive. And from the man's sides, it appeared that no Jew could have come anywhere near, near Goliath. And if he did, and if Goliath got hold of the fellow, the Jew would be squeezed to death. The Jews were shivering in their pants. I don't know whether they used to wear pants those days, but metaphorically they were shivering in their pants. So little David, he comes up to Saul, the commander, and he says, look, I will take that fellow on. So what? You go and look after your father's sheep. Because he was a shepherd boy. He was no prophet, he was no man, he was a boy a shepherd boy. So you, you want to fight the giant when we veterans of so many wars, none of us dare to confront the man, the giant. 
David says, look, look. He's so enthusiastic. Man, what an opportunity I have. I know I can do the job. Saul says, go and look after your father's sheep. He said, no, 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 no. You don't know, man. I can slay the giant. I can do it. So Saul offers David his sword and his shield. Young David says, look, I have never used it in my life before. And perhaps the sword is too heavy for him to carry. Now David had to be there. What was he doing there? You see, if the battle was taking place here, here where the Good Hope Center is, and our little David was five kilometers away, we would have never heard of David. David had to be there on the scene. He had to be there. So, when he refuses the sword and the shield, David says, look, I'm going to use my sling. So what? A toy? You're going to fight a giant with a toy? But he has seen the opportunity. This huge giant, slow, cumbersome, you know, man who's a giant, he's abnormal. He, he's not even steady on his feet. And David saw the opportunity. So eventually, eventually Saul gives him permission say go if you want to commit suicide go so David walks down the hill at the stream he picks up a few pebbles small stones and he puts one in his pouch and he swings and he swings to gain momentum the old-fashioned sling because they didn't discover rubber those days there was no rubber then but reporters have a tendency to sensationalize news it sells the paper easier better sensationalized things so this reporter as a Hindu Muslim Christian or Jew we don't know who he was he says and as he was quoting he said that said Christians who criticize Paul for Rushdie's death were hypocrites with a faith that was garbage there are two different events the man picks up one event from one place and picks up something else from another place and he joins them together as if this was one sentence uttered by Dida. That the religion of these people, the Christians, is garbage. Now, putting us on a war path with the Christians is a beautiful strategy. We were going to talk about is Israel set up for destruction and now they want to start discussing and fighting with the Christians. Did Dida say this or didn't he? You see, he's a brawler. He's looking for trouble. So those of you who were there, more than a thousand people were there, they will remember that when we were discussing this subject, should Rushdie die? Should he die? And what was the Judeo-Christian verdict? I gave a verdict. What is the verdict? There's not one word about that. What I said in brief was that the Judeo-Christian, meaning the Jewish religion and the Christian religion and the Islamic faith on this point of blasphemy, they are one. There's nothing mentioned about that. This was the verdict. I said, and if you do not carry out the duties and responsibilities which God has imposed upon you for making you the chosen people, he says, the same God, he says, in your book, in your Torah, in the book of Leviticus, the fourth book of Moses, chapter 26, verse 18. And after all this, if you do not obey me, God is talking. You Jews, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Seven times more. Anybody else, you commit one crime, one punishment. You Jews, you get seven times more punishment. This is your book. Your book of authority. Your book of God. Your Torah. Verse 21. Then if you walk contrary to me and are not willing to obey me, I will bring on you seven times more plagues. Seven times more plagues upon you, the Jews, according to your sins. Verse 28. Then I also will walk contrary to you. You walk contrary to me, I will also walk contrary to you in fury. And, e and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. I don't know, when Hitler incinerated six million Jews, whether it was six times or seven times, I don't know. But I said, look, this is according to the promise made by God to your nation. He's playing hide and seek. 
I don't want to do what he's doing because you are all catching with the camera and, and the photos and then you're going to show that Didak is also playing hide and seek. But you get this picture, I showed this to a Christian missionary soon after its publication. A missionary was always at my meetings, the first man to come and ask me questions. I went to him and I showed him this. I showed him this picture and the caption. He said, where did you get the picture? Where did you get the picture? I said, Look, this picture was done for me. He says, no. I said, this picture was specially taken for me. He says, no. So I'm asking him, you want a picture like this? He says, no. I said, look, I wanted it. I need this picture for my title of my pamphlet, His Holiness Playing Hide and Seek with the Muslims. Now, what better picture can anybody take? Is there anything human? Look, if you paint His Holiness, the Pope, a hundred thousand dollars to behave like this, would he have done it? No, I needed it and I get it in the post. I get it in the post. His Holiness playing hide and seek with Muslims. You can have this myself. Thank you. you see, I said His Holiness was set up. Everybody gets set up. And I was set up in 1967 by Jewish students of the University of Cape Town. I was here in your fair city on a lecture tour and my meetings were being advertised in the newspapers. What the Bible says about Muhammad, Christ in Islam, was Christ crucified, Muhammad the natural successor to Christ and so on. The Jewish students, they're seeing those adverts, they phoned the organizers and said, look, what about Mr. D. Dad coming and speaking to us? So they asked me, I said, it's a privilege by God to go and speak to my nephews, my children. Mm. And the meeting was arranged in the Rondi Bosch. In Rondi Bosch, the Jewish students had purchased a hall, you know, from the Christians. It was some church hall. They purchased it and they had the club running there. So I went down to talk to them. And in that talk, I was speaking about the Quran and the Jew. And I was reasoning with them that the problem between the Muslim and the Jew can be solved very, very easily. 